mean, Christmas was awesome, and it's not quite done. I mean, 25th has already passed, but we're still in a few more days of feeling the joy and the, the, uh, the, the familial nature of, of Christmas. But we're going to go ahead and jump right back into Genesis, and I've been looking forward to it. Uh, if you're new here, we studied for about 10 weeks, we studied the first few chapters of the book of Genesis, and now uh, in the winter into the spring, we're going to continue this study and complete the entire Entire, uh, in the study of the entire book of Genesis. Uh, so we're getting back in. Uh, and and uh, so I've been thinking a lot in the last five days, particularly about something that we're, we're about to study uh, in the book of Genesis. And that, and that is God's calling in a man's life, God's calling in a woman's life. And the fact is, when we use that phrase, we, we don't even all mean the same thing. Like, what does that even mean, the calling of God in a man's life? There's a central character in the book of Genesis, and, 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 and you, there's three or four different characters you might guess that I'm going to talk about today. But there's, there's one central character in the book of Genesis, and his life continues to be significant throughout the Old Testament, and his name is Abraham. His name is Abraham. It, his former name was Abram. Uh, his name is changed by God to Abraham. And he is known as the father of a nation, the father of the nation of Israel. A brief synopsis of his story, of his life, uh, very intriguing story. Uh, he was 75 years old before he ever really receives this calling in his life that we are so familiar with. 75 years old, uh, he's, he's continuing to raise and care for his nephew, the, the, the son of his, his dead brother, Abraham. He's 75 years old. He's, he's running a business that, that, that involves a lot of property and a lot of employees and a lot of livestock. So he's got his nephew He's got his business, he's got his stuff, he, have his, he has his, his wife who is now aging, because Abraham's aging, they're both getting up there in years, and God calls him to move to a distant land. Some of you here are 60 years of age, or you're, you're 70 years of age, or maybe you're in your 80s. What I want you to know today is that, that God doesn't give you a pass when he does the calling. It, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it, it's not <clears throat> impossible or even unlikely that in your 60s or your 70s or your 80s that God gives you a new direction. He gives you a new calling. He gives you new marching orders. Even at almost 50, it might be easy to think, well, now it's, it's time to just be, you know, fat and happy for the rest of my life. Just kick back and, and live the easy life. But, but Abraham's life and, and his story, uh, among other different ways in which it encourages us, it, it also encourages, encourages us as we age to realize God's not done. God still has a calling, a direction, uh, a new day for my life. Think on this. I imagine this, especially if you're, if you're my age or, or older than me. I imagine if God called you to take everything you have and, 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 and empty your bank account and, and, and take all the stuff that's movable, sell all the stuff that isn't movable, get all your stuff together, and, and, and move down to Mexico. Some of you were, were, were frightened just to go down there yesterday for the big feed. But imagine he said, you move to Mexico. And you said, well, okay, God, uh, I'll, I'll do that. But what am I moving to Mexico for? And God were to say, I won't tell you right now. I'm not going to tell you. You move, and I will tell you later why you have moved. That's the story of Abraham. Let's, 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 let's read from chapter 12. 
It says, now the Lord said to Abram, he had not yet changed his name. God wouldn't change his name until Abram was obedient and actually followed the calling of God. He says, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For the next several months we'll be talking about what that specifically means. For today we'll pass over it. We'll come back though. So Abram went. He was obedient. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot, that's his nephew that I spoke of, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired, in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. So as I was studying this story this week, and as I was considering uh, the next few months of our sermon series, I thought to myself, what do we even mean when we talk about God's calling in a person's life? When we use phrases like, God called me to fill in the blank, what do we even mean by that? First and foremost, there is a calling that the Bible speaks of in your life as a child of God, and as, as my, in my life as a, as a child of God. First and foremost, in the Bible, there is a calling that is effective. Meaning God always gets his way. It's effective and it's irresistible and it's, it's the voice of God drawing and calling and wooing your dead, my dead heart. For there was a time when you were spiritually asleep. Do you remember those days? When you were cold to the gospel and, and when when spiritual matters didn't really stir your soul in the least bit. If you think back, now now some of us us were drawn to Jesus at a very early age and it's hard to even remember those days, but but the Bible says that for every one of us, there there was a day when when our hearts weren't weren't stirred, our our souls weren't weren't, um, excited by the gospel, the story of Jesus, because we were dead spiritually. And, and, and there is no excitement that comes out of a dead person. And so we were dead. Another uh, metaphor would be that we were asleep spiritually. But then there was that day where God came along and he called you as though you were asleep and he said, wake up. And in a, in a startling fashion, we're awakened it wasn't voluntary. It wasn't optional. We heard the word. Of the, we, we heard uh, the calling, the, the voice of the Lord, and we were compelled to wake up. And you were you were awakened from your spiritual sleep, and and you now now that you're awake, you are alive spiritually. And you were formerly dead. That's what the Bible says. But now you're alive spiritually, and. and and, and that is, that is the most significant and, uh, the, uh, calling that the Bible speaks of, this effective uh, calling, spiritual awakening uh, in, in your life. That is the most, I believe, significant calling in a man's life and a woman's life. But there is another way in which we use this phrase, the calling of God. And, and there's, there are other examples of how God calls people in the Bible. And that's what we're going to talk about today and over the next several weeks um, this calling in one's life that most people speak about, 
That's what most of us are wondering about today. You're wondering, I'm wondering in my own life, like, what about the next 10 years? Like, what does God have for, for me over the next 20 years? What is, what is God's calling in my life? So I receive questions uh, when I'm giving, giving counseling. I, 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 often, I often hear questions like, like, what is God's calling in my life in the sense that who should I marry? Where should I go to school? What job should I take? Where should I live? Should I be a missionary? Should, should I be a mom? What is God's calling in my life? And so I hope today is a super practical message for you. It just seems like human nature to me that, that when uh, Christmas uh, is, is done and the calendar rolls over and it's a new year ahead of us, many of us, in fact, I'm not going to ask you to do so, but if I asked, I, I would bet that, that, that several of us, if not quite a few of us, would raise our hands today and say, yeah, I've been thinking those thoughts. Like it's a new year and I'm wondering what God's calling me to do and I'm thinking about doing this or I'm thinking about doing that and I'm trying to figure out what is God's calling on my life. Let me begin with, um, by leading you to, to, th to think for just a moment about yourself and, and who you are as a person. Think on this. Who do, who do people say that you are? If you would just, just take a moment. We're, we're mostly going to think about God today, but let's think about ourselves for just a moment and if you would just consider that, don't, don't answer out loud, of course, but, but think for a moment, really, really do this. Um, who do people think that I am? If you can just maybe think of some words or some phrases or just some, like, when people think about me, when people think about you, predominantly, what do people think about me? And now, actually, let me give you just a moment longer, because I really want you to do that. Who, who do people say you are? If I asked, how would they describe you? Now, let's go a little deeper now, and let's, let's think on this. Who do you think you are? Like, if you wanted to describe yourself, how would you describe yourself? Who do you think you are? It, it, it's interesting to consider how there might be a real difference between how I perceive other people see me and how I see myself. And one last question that we won't spend quite as much time on, but, but who are you really? Like, is there, a, is there maybe a dichotomy between who you are? how you want to be perceived and who you really are. So, so we're thinking in right now just about how do people perceive me and how do I want to be seen or perceived and then who am I really? There's a quote I want to put up here um, by by Oswald Sanders. Um, it's a little deep, a little heady, but, but maybe you can connect to this. Um, we're about to jump into the book of Romans, but just, just think on this for a moment. We are only what we are in the dark, Oswald Sanders says. All of the rest is reputation. When God looks or what God looks at is what we are in the, in the dark. And of course, he's speaking, he's speaking figuratively here. The imaginations of our minds, the thoughts of our heart, the habits of our bodies, these 
are the things that mark us in God's sight. Well, what's the point here? The point is that when we, when we strip away all of, the, all of the trappings that we've sort of built around us so that people don't really see who, the, the real me, all of the decoration and, and, and all of the, the, the ways in which I have built up walls and I have built up a reputation, when I strip all of that away, who I am in the dark, that's who God knows. That's who God loves. And that's who God is working on today. Not your reputation, but you. God knows who you really are. Everybody else knows who you want to be known as. Uh, You sometimes uh, have illusions of grandeur even about yourself. You think of yourself in the way that you want to be one day or how you want to be perceived. God really knows you. What's the point of all that? The point of all that is as God calls you, as God continues to reveal to you his calling, it's going to be perfect for the person you really are. The person in the dark as Oswald Chambers says. Not the person you want to be, not the person that people perceive you to be. God knows the real you, and he has a calling for the real you. If you go to the next slide, God has a plan for your days on this earth. If I was going to if I was going to, to give a definition to the calling of God in your life, this is how I would describe it. This is what we're talking about today. And, and, and while that seems so obvious, the point is, some of us live as though God really has no plan for us. We're just, make, we're just doing our best to, to work a job and, and, and come home at night and, and, and save for the future. What I want to compel you to believe is, if you're, if you're a child of the living God, he has, a, he has a plan. Not just for your eternity after you die, he has a plan for you now. I think most of us want to know what that is. So, how do we discern that? How do we discern, how do we determine what direction God is calling us in life? You may be finishing up some calling. Maybe there's been some real closure in your life in the last year. Or maybe you anticipate uh, some, some closure in the next few months. And you're, you're really thinking, like, what's next? I don't, I'm, I'm a little scared because I don't know what comes next. Or I'm, I'm just waiting on the Lord for the next, um, you know, my marching orders, my calling. How do we discern the calling of God in, in our lives? Romans 12, I believe, is a really apt, appropriate passage. Verse 2 it says this, do not be conformed to this world. Very, very, very uh, well-known passage here. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And what is the result, according to this passage, what is the result of your mind being renewed? Be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, you may, what? Discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, what is perfect. So what is this passage saying? It's talking about specifically what we're talking about today. And that is, if you want to determine or to discern what is the will of God in my life, the, the good and, and, and the acceptable and, and the perfect plan of God in my life. God's calling in my life. What is it? <clears throat> Paul says, here's how you determine that. <clears throat> you renew your mind. Now, I'm assuming what Paul is, a talk, is talking about when he says to renew your mind. <clears throat> I'm assuming that what he is saying, and I believe this is, This is based on just a scriptural pattern that we see in Paul's teaching. I believe what he's saying is you immerse yourself in God's word. 
Let's talk now. I just got some practical, some practical thoughts as, as our minds are being renewed. <clears throat> how do we discern the calling of God in my life? We're, 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 we're in Scripture, and if you're not, then, then, then your mind is not being renewed. And you're not going to be able to discern the will of the Lord. And, and, and as, we're in, as we're in deep seasons of prayer, and if you're not in deep seasons of prayer, then you, you're not renewing your mind. And, and you're not going to be able to discern the will of God. But, but, but if we are, in fact, uh, individually, <clears throat> in God's word regularly, and he's, he's <clears throat> renewing our mind, and we're in prayer regularly, and he's, he's renewing our, our mind, then <clears throat> here are some practical tips. How do I discern the calling of God in my life? Number one, I encourage you to consider your spiritual gifts. You're trying to figure out, what is God calling me to? Where am I going next? What am I going to do with my life? <clears throat> Maybe you're considering a vocation. Maybe you're consist- considering a ministry. And I would say, consider your spiritual gifts. Y- you may not even know what that, what that is. But, but the Bible, uh, Romans 12 is one good place to go. The Bible lists spiritual gifts. They're not necessarily, not really talents, uh, but spiritual gifts. In other words, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit supernaturally gives us gifts of, of teaching. And, and, and prophecy, and, and healing, and mercy, and, and leadership. And I don't believe it to be completely a closed list, uh, but, but there are gifts that, that, the, that the Bible says that the Holy Spirit gives you as a Christian, and all of a sudden you realize, like, I have this gift, and, and I, it's, not the, it's not a talent that I developed on my own. This is a gift that came from the Holy Spirit at conversion. And, and so First uh, Peter is one place that you can, you can read about. Based on the gift each one has received, use it to serve others. I always, I, I say this often when I talk about spiritual gifts. They're always given to serve the body of Christ. They're always given to serve others. Your spiritual gifts are for that purpose. Based on the gift each one of us received, use it to serve others as good managers of the varied grace of God. If anyone speaks, it should be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, it should be from the strength that God provides so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. I encourage you to write down Romans 12. It's the first few verses of Romans uh, uh, 12. Actually, it's... It's not the first few verses, but, but, but into Romans 12, uh, Paul gives us uh, another list. It's not the only list, but another li- list of the, of, the, uh, of the spiritual gifts that come from the Holy Spirit. Look at those. Look at those today. Consider, uh, consider for yourself, what spiritual gift or gifts do I think God has given me? And, and that is, is, is one of the ways in which we consider what calling God might be might have placed on our lives. As you consider the spiritual gifts that you have. Number two, consider your heart. Consider your heart. Here's what I mean by that. What do you enjoy? What do you enjoy doing? For instance, if, if, I, if I want to be, uh, if I were to say I want to be a Christian counselor, that that's what I want to pursue in life. I'm wondering if maybe that's God's calling on my life. Then I must consider, I must ask myself questions like, well, do I, do I enjoy listening to people talk about their thoughts? And do I, do I enjoy listening to people uh, talk about the brokenness of their lives? I mean, enjoy may not exactly be the right word, but, but you know what I mean. Do, is that something that really, really thrills me? Uh, I want to, to do that. And, and another question, another important question is, and do I already do that regularly? 
In other words, you might think that your heart is drawn in a certain direction. You might think you enjoy something, but if you're not already involved in that, you may be kidding yourself. If I, again, back to this example, if I, if I want to be a Christian counselor, then I must consider, do I enjoy listening to people talk uh, about themselves? Uh, it, uh, do I already do that regularly? If I don't enjoy doing that uh, you know, for free, then, then, then I may not, may not like it as a job. What moves you to action? What, what stirs your soul? Consider that as perhaps God's calling in your life. A dear old saint who passed away in the last few years, some of you knew him, he used to say, love Jesus and do what you want. And, and, and in that order, th- those are good instructions. You get those upside down and it's deadly. But if you love Jesus and, and you're your, your mind is being renewed daily through Scripture and through prayer by the Holy Spirit, then you must ask yourself, you must consider, what is my heart drawn to? What do, I, what do I enjoy as I'm trying to determine God's call in my life? I, I'm asked sometimes, um, Randy, how did you become a pastor? And uh, it's, it's become a simpler and simpler answer over the years. It hasn't changed. It's just, it's just a much more basic, simple answer. Here, here's what it is. I, I grew up at, at First Baptist Church, still, still a fine church here, here in Brownsville, First Baptist Church of Brownsville. And all the way through eighth grade, I not only went to church on Sundays, but I went to First Baptist School on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So like I got a break from church one day a week. Uh, now for high school, I went to Hannah, but, but all those years, all those years, um, I, I was at church. And it might, it might sound like it's, like it's heading in, one of those, in the direction where people tell you like how they, they hate the church and they have all this baggage because they, they grew up, but... You know, they grew up in parochial school and they got, that's not my story. My story is one of deep joy. Uh, my time in the church all throughout uh, my, my childhood and my youth, it was, it was, it was joy. It, it, was, it, was, it was a conduit of God's grace in my life. Like it was, it was a beautiful experience. So when I was a teenager, and I considered the possibility of serving in the church vocationally, getting paid to be a pastor, I, I thought as a teenager, like, that would be the best job in the world. And, and I, was, I was a punk teenager just like any other teenager and, and had my own, you know, my own junk going on. But, but I knew that there was something special about the church. And I knew that it, for me, was a, was, was like this lifeline. It was, it was life-giving. It was, it was, it was God's grace and, and God's, the way in which God blessed me on a regular basis. And, and so my heart uh, was just drawn in that direction. And so God's calling in my life was, was that simple. I thought, I, of course I want to do that. That's like the best job in the world. I want to, I want to, be like those guys. I want to have their life. I want, to, I want to lead people spiritually the way they lead people spiritually. And, and that's, it was as simple as that for me. It was a heart matter, but not in some super spiritual, like, I mean, I mean, it was a heart matter in the, in the sense that, that I just enjoyed that. I just, I knew that I would enjoy that for a lifetime. And a couple of times I have tried to, not in a, not in a sinful or a or broken, but a couple times I've tried to step away from being a pastor and do other things, and, and I'm just, I just have to be a pastor. It's just what I enjoy. So what moves your heart? First Timothy 3, 
Paul is talking to younger Timothy. And he's talking to really young people who are trying to determine what they're going to do with their lives. <clears throat> and he's specifically talking about, about men who are called to be elders in the church. And Paul says this, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, another word for elder, he desires a noble task. It's also, an, it's also another word for pastor. Paul says, if anyone aspires to the office of, of overseer, elder, pastor, synonymous words, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. What is, what is uh, Paul saying here? He's saying that, that if, you're going to, uh, if, if you're going to be a pastor, uh, an elder, an overseer, then, then you should want that. You shouldn't do it just because like, well, nobody else is going to do it, so I guess I'll do it, or it'll make me look good, or people think highly of me. He's really talking about this heart matter. He's saying it's something you should aspire to. Like, like I don't know if I'm qualified, but man, I really, my heart is drawn to this. And I would say that, that, that whatever uh, you are considering as God's calling in your life, it better be something you aspire to. It better be something you're really drawn to. As God is renewing your mind, because without God's renewing our mind, there are a lot of things that look attractive to us that are deadly, but, but, but as, as God is renewing our minds, consider, what do I aspire to do? That is an important matter. Number three, in this question, how do I discern the calling of God? It's very similar. Consider your interests and your abilities. This isn't quite spiritual uh, gifts. Now we're actually talking about um, talents, things that you've trained yourself to do or that, you, that, was, that was passed on to you by your mother or by your father, you know, natural abilities that you have, interests that you've always had, um, maybe interests that have been, that have been passed down uh, from, from previous generations to you. Um, I already mentioned, what, what are you doing right now? Look at what you're doing right now. And, and, and so really, really that's similar to, to number two. So, so we'll move on to number four. Number four, consider the affirmation of your church community. Um, when we individually are deciding what God's calling is in our lives, um, as, as Christ followers, as Christians, and as, as members of the body of Christ. Um, and, and by the way, we have... And I say this with, with great joy and great pride. We actually have membership here at River Church. Um, we believe that membership matters. And uh, we can argue all day long about churches that you've been at where maybe they didn't have membership or whatever. But here, un under the, the leadership of, of Jesus, uh, we, your elders, we're under shepherds, meaning we're under the shepherding of Jesus. And we've determined that, that membership is a good thing here at River Church. And so we have membership. And if you haven't joined and become a member, you're still welcome here. And, and we still consider you a, every, every, every bit as important as anyone else. But you might consider actually being a, a member in 2019. And we'll have a number, another membership class here in the next um, six weeks. I'll be telling you more about that. But but one of the reasons is important, it is important membership at, at, Rivership, at River Church is because it gives us permission to speak into one another's lives. I've, I've seen people, at, not just at River Church, but over the course of my life, who, who regularly attend a church and then they, they fall into some deep sin or they're making some really unwise choices. And then church family members try to speak into their lives and they'll say something like this. You, you don't think you would ever say this, but they'll say something like this. 
What business of yours? I'm not even a member here. You know, or they'll say, like, I, I just like coming here because I just like to hear Randy preach, but I'm not even a member. What business do you have speaking into my life? But, but, but membership is really about submission in that we're saying this, I, I, I give you permission to hold me accountable. I give you permission to speak into your life. And you might say, well, look, I, we can do that without formal membership. Okay, I, I, I get that. But that really is what membership is about. It's about giving one another permission. I submit to you, the body of Christ, speaking to my life, go ahead, I want to hear what you have to say. I mean, said all that, <clears throat> I, I've, I, I've seen numerous, uh, numerous examples where young people, especially, are trying to determine God's calling in their life, and they undervalue the affirmation of their church family. They, they, they determine that they want to go a certain direction, that God is calling them a certain direction. And, and you know what? Without anyone else speaking into your life graciously, uh, you may be lying to yourself, lying to yourself. You know, when I was a little boy, I used to think when I'd watch Muhammad Ali fight on TV that if they'd put me in the ring, like I could take him. And I was like eight years old, you know. Like, uh, but I was, I was fooling myself uh, I, I, I thought more highly of myself than I really um, should have. But that not, that's not so much the, the point as is that sometimes we just are having a little trouble finding ourselves, figuring ourselves out, and a brother or sister in Christ speaking into my life helps me think more clearly. It's one of the ways in which our, our, our minds are being renewed. Consider the affirmation of your church family. Go to your elders Go to people that, the, who speak into your life with authority and say, I'm thinking about this. What do you think? <clears throat> and then be willing to actually listen. And, and be willing to actually recalibrate based on what you hear. You know, some of us are really willing to listen, but we're much less willing to alter our course. Number five, <clears throat> as we are... Um, considering um, what might God's calling in my life be. Number five, consider people and needs more than places and things. That's a bit wordy, but, but here's what I mean by that. Most of us think way too much, spend way too much time thinking about things and places, and we spend way too little time thinking about people and needs. Do you follow me? I used to think, the younger Randy, I used to think that moving to a new place that was a cool place, and maybe it was like, like on a beach somewhere, you know, or, or, or you know, it was, it was out in the woods, or maybe I, I would think the opposite. Man, a cool place, like, like real super urban, where I can, I can walk everywhere I go and I can ride the subway. I used to think that moving to a new place because it was a cool place, like that was the way to go. But I have since learned, it's always about people. It's always about people. Not places, not things, but people and needs. Like, 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 maybe we would think this. Um, would it be more romantic to care for people in Africa or Abilene? You know? Right? And I'm not saying you should or shouldn't go to Abilene or Africa, but, but that's a good example of what I'm talking about. Like, like, it's not really about places and things. It's, it's really about people and needs. Number six is quite similar. Consider a new agenda rather than a new adventure. Sometimes adventure can become for us a God. I know I can wrestle with that. A new adventure can, can, can <clears throat> stir my affections and my emotions more than God sometimes. 
I believe, is like a new mindset. You, you, you're probably operating in the flesh, like the old man, like the dead spiritual man, if you're, if you're just looking for a, a thrill, a new adventure. And, and I believe that we as Christians are mo- mostly called to a new agenda, a new mindset, a new, a new way of thinking. You can look this up later, but 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 20, it, it's speaking to, to uh, pagans who've become Christians. And Paul says this uh, in, many, in several ways. 1 Corinthians 7, 20, you can look, at it, look it up later. We're not going to project it. But he says this, you remain in the condition you were before you were called. The idea being, you don't have to, to go out and remake yourself and, and, and come up with a new uh, adventure for you. Now that you've been called by God, in that passage anyway, Paul is saying you need a new agenda, a new mindset more than you need a new adventure and place. If you're not satisfied with the here and the now, uh, maybe you won't be satisfied with a new place and a new way of living. You probably need a new a new agenda rather than a, than a relocation. And, and, and every one of us works, right? I mean, every one of us needs to work. We need to work a job. But, but maybe your job for you won't be your adventure. And that's okay. I mean, if, you're, if your job is your adventure, for me, that's kind of been the case. And that's awesome. But, but maybe you don't need for your job to be your adventure. Maybe you just need a new ad- agenda. <clears throat> I've seen a lot of particularly young men and women move, sometimes needlessly, thinking that, they're, that God's calling in their lives um, involved a, a really significant move. And, and maybe it does, but, but consider maybe what you need is a new mindset, a new agenda. Um, I'll tell you a story about, about somebody that, uh, that I knew in Albuquerque. Um, his, name was, his name was Tom. And he sold light fixtures until the day he retired. Uh, and his job was not his adventure. Like, that was not for him. I knew him, I knew him quite well. Uh, know him quite well. He... He didn't, like, he, didn't, he didn't like eat, sleep, and, and dream about light fixtures. Like that wasn't his, uh, his passion. It was his job. Um, but he was the church's best greeter for 20 years in Albuquerque. Uh, my, my kids know him. My kids still remember him. We went to visit 10, 12 years after we had been away from that church just a few summers ago. And there was Tom on a sunny morning. He, he, was, he was making people feel welcome. And there was not a new person in that church who wasn't greeted by Tom. And if, if, if you saw someone and you couldn't quite, even as a pastor, you couldn't quite remember their name, you could go to Tom and Tom knew who they were. Tom wasn't living for an adventure, but but he had an agenda, and it was, it was the mind of Christ. It was sharing the love of Christ, the gospel of Christ, with anybody who walked through that door. 2019 is almost on us, and, 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 and for some of us, we're, 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 we're trying to figure out, how do I determine God's call? What I would say is, you be about the renewing of your mind. Your deep seasons of prayer and, and deep seasons spent in God's Word. Be about the work of renewing your mind and you're not going to miss God's call in your life. Let's pray.